Hello, I'm Tom. I'm Simon. And welcome to Crash Course Cryosphere. The cryosphere is the part of the Earth system where water exists in solid form. So that could be snow, river ice, sea ice, glaciers, even the polar caps. The cryosphere covers a significant part of the Earth's surface and is a significant influence on climate, so it's important that we understand it. In this series, we're going to be teaching you about the science of ice and also trying to provide some historical context to its study. I'm going to be here in the library at the Scott Polar Research Institute talking about how maths and physics influence our understanding of the cryosphere. I'm going to be here in the Scott Polar Research Institute's lecture theatre to talk to you about the science of ice. And I'm also going to be here in the museum and the archive of the Institute talking to the head curator and looking at artefacts that shed some light on a history of our understanding of the cryosphere. So that's what you've got to look forward to in this series, but to kick us off on this episode, I'm going to be looking at the physics of how substances change from liquid to solid. I'll be looking at where the water on Earth has come from, and I'll be dabbling a little bit in how water turns to ice as well. Cue the intro. To get us started, both in an icy sense and a serious sense, where does water come from? Why is there water on Earth? And how much is there elsewhere in the solar system? Well, this is how much water we think is in the solar system. Now, these are some pretty rough estimates that we've put together here, and certainly doesn't include every single potential body that has water. What we're doing this in is in Earth units, so one Earth unit of water. In this case, it's about 200 millilitres. Now, what else have we got elsewhere in the solar system? Well, on the moon, we actually have traces of water. This is very much not to scale, this one. And it's ice in the craters on the poles of the moon. On Mars, the red planet, we have 0.5 Earth units worth of water. Now, Mars is particularly interesting because this water is locked up in glaciers at both poles. This is obviously very cool for us as glaciologists because it means our work is suddenly relevant, not just on Earth, but also on Mars. The blue planet itself, Earth with one Earth unit worth of water. And then we have Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. This has 2.5 Earth units of water and is largely an icy ball, which is completely covered in solid ice. Effectively, we think sea ice covering a vast ocean. And here we have the one I can never pronounce, but this time we will go for Encladius? Enceladus. Enceladus. I will someday remember this. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and here we have five Earth units of water, and that's very similar to Europa in that it's an icy moon. And finally, we have Ganymede, which is some very new data on here. And we're not really sure what's going on, except we know there's 10, possibly, it's a pretty rough guess, but maybe 10 Earth units of water. From all of this, we can see that whilst the Earth is special in terms of harbouring life, in terms of water, there's actually a lot of it else around the solar system. And a lot of it's in an icy state. As with Mars, this is a great news for those of us who study the cryosphere, as this means that our work is not only relevant on our Earth, but it's relevant across the solar system. There are a number of competing hypotheses, which are not mutually exclusive, as to where all the water on Earth has come from. The first of these is exoplanetary origins. So this is from asteroids or protoplanets impacting on the Earth's surface during its early formation. We actually know that most of the water on Earth came very early on in the Earth's life cycle. And we know this by comparing hydrogen isotopes between the Moon, asteroids on Earth, which indicate that, yes, most water on Earth is actually very old. A hydrogen isotope is just a hydrogen atom, but with a different number of neutrons in the nuclei. This means it has the same chemical properties, but just a different atomic weight. The second hypothesis is that not all water on Earth came from exoplanetary objects, that at least some of the water must have come from the Earth itself. There are two reasons for this. The first of these is that not all of the exoplanetary objects that impacted on the Earth will have brought water with them. This reduces the chance of the overall water body being all exoplanetary. In addition to this, it's been found that the ratio of hydrogen isotopes on comets is about double that of oceanic water. This strongly suggests that these two separate bodies have different sources of water on them. A couple of suggested Earth-centered sources of water include the leakage of water from hydrated minerals and, even more awesomely, bacteria. Very early on in the Earth's life cycle, there was a very exotic bacteria that had very weird energy-gaining pathways, the byproducts of which may have been water. However, the bacteria one, whilst extremely cool, is unlikely to be a major source. A third sort of mini-hypothesis has recently come out of some really cool research on Baffin Island. There they found that the water in the lavas is quite possibly pre-solar. This means it's been around since before the formation of our solar system, let alone the Earth. It suggested that possibly this water entered the area via dust grains onto which it had been absorbed. 
Of course, this is probably a very small source of water, but it's very interesting and very cool to note that actually some of the water on Earth can be very, very ancient indeed, predating even the existence of our solar system. We'll be returning to Tom later in the episode, but speaking of history, it's time for us to take our first trip to the archives of the Institute. Welcome to the Polar Museum. I'm here with Charlotte Connolly, who's the museum curator. What does that mean, by the way? What do you do here? <laughs> Uh, well, so the museum's part of the Scott Polar Research Institute and we have a collection of things related to the polar regions. We were founded in 1920 uh, and it was set up as a place, the whole institute was set up as a place for exchanging knowledge and also equipment. And so that's where the start of the collection came from. And now we have a public museum that anyone can visit for free. And we've got lots of our collections on display. And my job is really making sure that they're cared for properly, stored properly, and that we get them out as often as we can for people to look at or to do research with. So what do we have in front of us here? Well, this is a walrus skull. Uh, so the walrus, as you probably know, is a very large Arctic mammal. And it's one of the many objects in the collection that was collected for scientific study. Now, actually, we don't know a great deal about this. Like many museums, we've got an awful lot of things in storage, and some of them we know a lot about, and then others we hardly know anything about at all. Uh, and this is one example. It's something that was maybe found in someone's office and then got offered to us. Um, so we know it's a walrus skull, but beyond that, not a huge amount, really. So you don't know the provenance, where it came from, anything like that? No. and. It, most of our objects we do know something about. I mean, what most people don't realise is that for most museums we only have about 10% of our collection on display at any one time, and the rest sits in store for people to come and do research. So it's available to come and look at, and maybe someone could come and tell us more about it, exactly where it came from, or perhaps what happened to it and why it passed away. Um, but, yeah, beyond that, we don't really know an awful lot, but it's clearly been looked after. It's got some screws in it and things. It's been held together and maybe displayed at some point in its history. So this is one large Arctic mammal, but we're talking about the cryosphere in this series a lot as if it's like some inert object, but mm -hmm. it's not, it's a living environment. And we have another item here. We do. Which is yet another Arctic, yeah, bigger, large Arctic mammal. Bigger than the room, I think. So this is a tusk from a narwhal, which is another large Arctic mammal. The narwhal's part of the whale family, so it's quite closely related to beluga whales. And this is actually a tooth. It's one of its incisor teeth that over Just the years... Just got a bit out of hand. Yeah, pretty much. Um, used for showing off, I think, largely. So their main diet is actually cod and halibut. Uh, so clearly it's not designed for capturing... Well, you can spear a few on there. Yeah, People are trying to eat them off of yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, uh, lack of opposable thumbs might make that a bit tricky. So, um, uh, yeah, it was mostly used for fighting between the males. Um, so how did this come into the collections then? Well, this is actually a recent addition, and it's part of our handling collection rather than the historic collection, because we already had some narwhal tusks. And it came from Greenland, so we've got quite a lot of information. The person who brought it in gave us a map from where it was collected, and it was collected by someone who was on an expedition doing a completely different kind of science and they found this on the beach and thought ah, it's too good I'll have that um, so they collected it sadly that individual died a few years ago and his wife donated it to us so uh, it's going to be part of our handling collection and go on to help us educate all the people that come through our doors over the years and is that something that commonly happens then you get people that do an expedition and come back with things they weren't expecting to find uh, yeah I think that's pretty <laughs> common uh, and in fact the hardest part of my job probably is saying no to things because people have collected so much stuff over the years and we have to be able to store it properly. Um, so sadly we have to turn down lots of really wonderful things that we just don't have space for, which is a bit of a shame. I'm glad you didn't say no to this because it's really cool. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be returning to the archives next week, but right now it's time to go back to Tom, who wants to talk about one of the most fundamental processes in the cryosphere. So now we have our water. But how does that water become ice? And how does that ice become snow? And how does that snow then become a glacier? Well, yes, it just has to freeze. But actually, when you start to look at the detail, things are, of course, a little bit more complicated. Without external influences, water in the atmosphere will actually only freeze at around minus 36 degrees Celsius. This is because minus 36 is actually the freezing point of truly pure water. Of course, in nature, it's very rare for us to get pure water. And there's actually a number of ways in which we can have water freezing from somewhere between 0 degrees Celsius and minus 36 degrees Celsius. One of the ways in which we can get water to freeze at higher temperatures than minus 36 is by having particles in the water droplets. This is a process known as nucleation. Examples of such nucleating centres include things like black carbon, dust and even microbes. Interestingly, it's actually these biological sources that can probably get water to freeze at the highest temperature. This is because fundamentally they have a higher surface area due to all the little spikes and stuff as compared to the smoother particles of carbon or whatever. 
Thus, not only will a colder atmosphere lead to more snow, but a colder and dustier atmosphere leads to more snow. Because not only are you meeting the threshold for freezing easier, but you also have more material around which the ice crystals can nucleate. This relationship between water availability and nucleation sources is one of the reasons why you get polar deserts. Now, we're very used to thinking of deserts in terms of hot places, but actually you get them a lot in the cryosphere as well, particularly in Antarctica. One of the reasons why the Antarctic dry valleys exist is because not only is all the water around them locked up in the ice, but also that ice is on top of the land, which prevents dust from being released. And obviously there's relatively little microbial life or things ejecting pollen into the air around which ice in the atmosphere could then nucleate and then fall to Earth. Therefore, you end up with the Antarctic dry valleys, which are actually one of the driest places on Earth and have been taken increasingly by scientists as a good place to study as a proxy for Mars. Now, unfortunately, at this point, we're probably going to have to break out some physics. Thanks, Tom. Now, in order to talk about water going from solid to liquid and vice versa, we need to talk about phase transitions. Phase is kind of another word for what we call the state of a substance. A substance like water can have different states that can be solid, liquid, or gas. And what defines a state is a consistent set of molecular interactions over a large set of space. So in a solid, as we have in our water molecule model over here, this is water molecules arranged in a crystalline configuration that we call ice. There are lots of very strong bonds between the molecules within the lattice or within the ice structure. If we were to melt that bit of ice, then the bonds between the molecules would be much weaker. They'd be jostling around, but still connected to each other. Whereas if we were to transition that liquid into a gas, then there'd be far fewer interactions between the molecules and they'd be flying around floating freely. We can represent where a particular substance like water is in these states using what we call a phase diagram, which we have up here. So we have along our x-axis temperature and along our y-axis pressure. What this simply tells us then is, say we're in a room, we're at about 20 degrees Celsius and we're at atmospheric pressure, so about 1000 hectopascals or 1000 millibars. What we can do then is trace along our temperature and our pressure and we can see that water is most thermodynamically stable in these conditions as a liquid. That's all this diagram is. It shows you where the most thermodynamically stable point is. Now, each region here refers to a different state of matter, so solid, liquid, or gas. And where there's a boundary between the two, it's possible for, for example, water to exist as ice and as liquid water under the same conditions. Let's say then that we decrease the temperature in this room. On our diagram, this is equivalent to us putting a point here where we are and then moving it to the left as the temperature decreases and decreases until we reach the line between where water is most thermodynamically stable as a liquid and where it's most stable as a solid. That line is known as a phase transition. And while there's a certain amount of energy that's associated with moving the temperature to the left and decreasing the temperature, if we want to change our water from liquid to solid, then we need a certain amount of extra energy that we call latent energy or latent heat to get those bonds between the molecules going. Now, in this case, going from liquid to solid is actually what's known as an exothermic reaction. So by the water molecule snapping into a crystalline structure, it emits energy into its surroundings. So we end up from going from this chaotic, disordered state into this very regular state that we have over in our molecule model on the left. So the key takeaway from this then is that water can exist in different states and in order to transition from one state to another, you require an extra little bit of energy known as the latent energy. Back to you, Tom. The newly formed ice crystal is, of course, heavier than the air around it, and so it starts to fall to Earth. As it falls down, it will usually pass through more humid layers of air and start to pick up more water around it. However, this water is added in a very structured manner, and you'll always have a six-sided hexagonal crystal. So no matter how big your snowflake gets, it will always have six sides. Even though you've formed snow high up in the Earth's atmosphere, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get snow on the ground. This is because there could be warmer air masses below where you formed your snow that will melt it as it passes through. Therefore, in order to get snow on the ground, you need cool air all the way down. So we have our frozen water in the sky falling to Earth. But what happens once it reaches the ground? And how do these small little ice crystals become gigatons worth of glaciers that carve valleys, shroud entire continents, and change the climate as we know it? Well, that's what we're going to look at in the next nine episodes. In this episode, we've covered that the cryosphere is any part of the Earth's system where water is frozen. This includes sea ice, the polar caps, and glaciers. That while we're considering the Earth's cryosphere, ice is everywhere in the solar system. 
that water freezes at a bunch of different temperatures depending on the pressure and temperature the water is experiencing and other factors like nucleation. And lastly, that for water to freeze, it must undergo a phase transition with associated latent energy. Well, that's all we have time for this week, but before you go and like this video, which you totally should, by the way, in the description, the first link is to a questionnaire. Now, we'd like you to go and click on that link and fill it out. The reason it's there is because we want to know how much you know about the cryosphere at the start of this series. So, by the end of the series, we'll give you another questionnaire and see how effective this series was in teaching you. So, go and answer those questions and we'll see you at that link again, or one very similar to it, in about nine weeks' time. Thank you for watching, and we'd also like to thank these people up here who made this series possible, and in particular, the Recover Project at the University of Exeter, who gave us funding, and the Scott Polar Research Institute here in Cambridge for accommodating us. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you for more icy adventures next week.